Welcome to the University Church Online on this sixth Sunday of Easter, May the 9th, 2021, better known as Mother's Day here in the US. We hope that we find you both well and safe. It transpires that Mother's Day has a, a historic connection with Methodism. Um, you may perhaps be aware that it was in May of 1908 that Anna Jarvis organized the first official Mother's Day celebration in the US at Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church in Grafton, West Virginia. On Mother's Day, uh, we celebrate all that it means to be a mother, but we are of course aware that for everyone, this is not necessarily a happy day. There are some people for whom uh, mom was not necessarily a figure to be uh, loved and adored. There are others who perhaps wanted to be mothers and never could. Others who didn't particularly want to be a mother and yet discovered that they were. There are all sorts of reasons why somebody might have a problem with Mother's Day. And so uh, today, as we think about mothers and motherhood, uh, we look really to the image of uh, the great parent, the parent who we hope will never let us down, will always be on our side, and will always be looking out for us. So if Mother's Day is a celebration for you, then I celebrate with you. And if it isn't a day of celebration for you, then uh, I hope that all will be well and that you will make it through the day. Now, over the last really many weeks, we've spoken of our response during the current pandemic as one that gives the highest priority to loving our neighbors, the strangers among us, even our enemies, as much as we love ourselves. We have seen that to love our neighbor as we love ourselves means that we must see their participation in the good as fundamental to our own participation in the good. To love God is to will the good of what God loves, which is the neighbor's good, the stranger's good, even our enemy's good. And over the last several weeks, we've heard from some members of our book club studying anti-racism, where we have seen that these very same ideas rise to the surface. And today, we welcome two more of our book group participants who will share some of their thoughts with us. Good morning, I'm Gail Shaber. I'm a member of the University Church and I'm also a member of the uh, Anti-Racism Book Club. And good morning, my name is Bob Ball and I'm a member of the University Church and a part of the uh, Book Club. And we are the last two that will be presenting about our, what our discussions and what we've learned and how it has affected us in our year-long book study. Um, you've heard from Holly and Heather and John in the last couple of weeks. Um, they've shared their personal feelings and what they've learned um, about our year-long studies. We've, the book club has actually studied four books. One was a novel and three were nonfiction. I didn't join the book club until uh, they were going into the second book. And Bob, I have to tell you, I think you already know this, but it was not always a real easy topic to tackle. Whether we were sitting at home reading, I mean, I can remember sitting there looking at the book and going, no, or mm -hmm. good idea. And it wasn't easy discussing it on Wednesday nights because I think we need to let everybody know that we didn't always agree. Um, I think after talking and listening to each other, I think we usually came to common ground and I know I would usually walk away from our Wednesday night discussions feeling much more part of the group than when I went in because I had a lot of the questions answered. Personally, I think it was so difficult because of my age and upbringing, okay? I'm a baby boomer, so that kind of gives you my age. 10 years after World War II ended, I was in elementary school. 
And I remember, and really long sometimes maybe, that those times could come back. Because that was a time that we were taught and we could believe that my country could do no wrong, uh, everything was secure and happy, and the future was going to be perfect. Um, and it wasn't until I got older, and actually even in this book study, that I realized not everybody got to grow up with those feelings. Um, when I used to think of racism, I thought about one-on-one -on -one racism. Like, I would never and would never call somebody by a racial slur. Never would have thought of doing it. Wasn't brought up that way. Um, I would never refuse to go like to a public pool or restaurant or school because it was integrated. You know, I, that just never occurred to me. So when they, people would talk about racism, that we still had it, I would think to myself, no. You know, I mean, I knew it wasn't part of my world, but in the last month, or really earlier than that, I started realizing that people didn't have those same types of growing up and the same types of lives that I did. Um, it's really hard to think about racism, and I think that was what was so valuable about the book study and the discussions was because we got to study at home and think about systemic racism. And it really provided an opportunity to reflect. And I'm not sure in this busy world anymore how often we just sit and think about something and think deeply about it. So that's kind of where I ended up because of our discussion group. Oh, well, Gail, uh, one of the interesting things about this is that um, uh, I'm older than you. <laughs> At least somebody is. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, I was born uh, about, uh, I think about maybe eight months prior to the United States entering World War II. Okay. So in 1941. So I grew up down in the southern part of West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, close to the Mason-Dixon line. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, still a lot of racism, even though we were north of the Mason-Dixon line and part of the Union, mm -hmm. supported the Union, there was still a lot of racism. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of places that I particularly remember it as, a, as a child was when I would go to the theater, movie, and uh, I knew that uh, black people were not allowed to sit on the main floor of the theater. And they had to sit in the balcony and quite honestly, um, uh, I knew I, I had been up in the balcony before, and I knew that the, bar the balcony was partitioned so that uh, black people had to sit on one side of the partition, and white people who smoked would sit on the other side of the partition. So our black brothers and sisters had to sit up there and, and breathe the smoke of the white people who were smoking. Sad thing. Um, also, the uh, water fountains that were uh, there uh, marked uh, for whites only. I, I saw that as a kid. I didn't know what to do about it. Uh, I had heard of other events that went on. Um, at the same time, it, it left me with a feeling of not wanting to hurt people. I don't know exactly how that came about, uh, but I would always um, be very sensitive and caring about people wherever they are. Uh, and whatever race they happen to be. Um, so uh, even though I was uh, growing up in that kind of an area, uh, I still managed to uh, believe that everybody was human, even though there were things that were taught to us about uh, black people not necessarily being human. Uh, so that was sort of my introduction into life and the issue of race. Now, uh, in relationship to our book club, uh, I know that I wanted to uh, try to initiate a conversation between some of our black brothers and sisters in Toledo and our group. And in reaching out and attempting to create that, I found that they were not quite as willing. Uh, and 
And as I thought about it, I understood why. Uh, I, when you think about Warren AME Church here in Toledo, Warren AME Church is the Warren African Methodist Episcopal Church, which started uh, back in the late 1700s as a result of uh, some uh, nasty things that was happening within the church at that time. In Philadelphia, there was St. George United Methodist Church. Well, it was called St. George Methodist Episcopal Church. And uh, again, black people were not totally welcome. They were there, but they were prevented from even kneeling and praying in that church. And so uh, Richard Allen became very upset about that, and he took, he was a black leader, and he took the black people from that church and began what's called the, uh, the AME church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which grew uh, significantly across the country. There was another church uh, that I came across historically that did some nasty things because the church has not always been caring and loving like Jesus would have us to be. And that church was in, in Hagerstown, Maryland. It was called at the time St. Paul's Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, now St. Uh, John Wesley uh, Church, United Methodist Church. But um, uh, there were stories about how even they were not allowed to go to the altar and take communion. Black people were not. Uh, so when I think about people, uh, black, or my brothers and sisters, not willing to come and talk to us, then I think they don't trust us. They don't trust that we would really be serious about this and that white people would really care about trying to change the whole issues of racism in our community, in our state, in our nation, in our world. So, uh, and, and I, I have to admit that our, our, our uh, book study has made me more aware of some of the racism that's deeply embedded within me. And I don't like it, but I'm working to overcome it. So that's just part of the history, and of my history and the history of the church that uh, causes our black brothers and sisters to be reluctant to come and talk with us. Well, and I just tripped over something. Um, I was researching something in the Book of Discipline a couple of weeks ago. Oh, my. And I, Julian will laugh at that, but anyways. Uh, it was talked about how they tried to solve some of the racism leading up to the Civil War. And one of the things that they did, they had what was called the Central Conference. Mm -hmm. And it was where all the, the black Methodist churches could be involved because they could not be, they were not welcomed into all the other conferences. And uh, I found that very surprising. But I'm actually uh, sorry, it took a lot of courage for you to reach out to the Warren AME Church. Um, I'm sorry it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. It's given me another idea, but right now we have a big project, so I might suggest that one in the future. Sure, sounds great. All right, did you have something you wanted to share with us? Yes, uh, also uh, another piece of, of history um, simply because what we're talking about is uh, supporting this uh, fair school funding uh, plan mm -hmm. that's uh, before the General Assembly mm -hmm. now. And we need to be aware of it and we need to hopefully support its passage. Um, but I wanted to say that the reason that we as United Methodists should be concerned and should care about uh, this particular plan is because historically the United Methodist Church has always been uh, supportive of public schools. Uh, one of the reasons why we do not have a Methodist uh, elementary school or a Methodist high school mm -hmm. is because we've always believed in public schools. Pu public schools for all children, regardless of race mm -hmm. or uh, ethnic origin, that uh, we believe in educating our children. Uh, back during the industrial age in Europe, 
one of the things that happened then was that children did not get an education and they were uh, working every day of the week except Sunday uh, in the factories. And so what happened was that some of our Christian brothers and sisters who had a passion and confession for this then created what they called Sunday school. It was actually not Sunday school. It was, it was a uh, literary school. It was to help people become literate, and, and particularly poor children. So uh, our church people have always believed in caring for our children and educating them, which by the way, you know, will produce better citizens mm -hmm. for the future. Now, uh, one other piece of that is in the American colonies, uh, one of the key players of uh, the establishing of this kind of Sunday school or school for the children uh, was done by our, our founding uh, father, uh, John Wesley, uh, who was in Savannah, Georgia at the time, and there at uh, Christ uh, Parish Church started, <coughs> started a Sunday school. Later in the 1700s, Methodist Bishop uh, Francis Asbury established a school for black, uh, for the children of black slaves. Now, I have to say that white adults benefited by that because they would go to the school as well. But it was mainly geared at trying to educate our, uh, our black children who were not being cared for. Now, from that point on, the history of Methodism and its support of education is critical. We believe in education and we believe in supporting public education for the children. And then, of course, we have colleges and we have seminaries, all because education is a critical piece of our life. I'd like you to share something um, that you talked about one time with me um, as we were talking about your contact with Warren AME yeah, Church. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, uh, uh, in my conversation with a member of Warren AME Church, um, she came across a bulletin, mm -hmm. and uh, in that bulletin, they had planned to have a conversation mm -hmm. after church one Sunday, mm -hmm. and the, uh, uh, the plan was that there would be an interracial roundtable discussion, and the subject would be interracial goodwill in Toledo, uh, what shall we do to improve it? And uh, the important thing about that is that you look at the date of this bulletin, and it was September the 5th, 1943, 78 years ago. And here we are still talking about this, trying to figure out how to better improve race relations in our community, in our church, in our state, in our nation, and in our world. If I might add one other thing sure. about all of this as well. The Fair School Funding uh, Plan uh, has many, many parts to it. And one of those is relative to technology. And we should be particularly attentive to this right now because of the pandemic and our children not being able to go face-to-face uh, -face in school. And so they were doing virtual mm -hmm. school. And I have three great-grandchildren who are in public schools, and they were working with the, the technology and oftentimes would have uh, difficulty with that mm -hmm. because the technology would fail from time to time. We also know that here in Toledo that there were uh, children in the inner city who did not have access to the internet. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully, Toledo Public Schools uh, arranged the, and, and, and several buses, school buses, uh, with the equipment that would allow them to go around neighborhoods and enable uh, kids in the, those neighborhoods to connect to the internet. That was helpful, but there were still kids that uh, were not able to be um, connected because they didn't have the devices. So one of the important things about the Fair School Funding Plan is that it includes sufficient funding for every child, every child, to have a device and provide all schools with su sufficient bandwidth to support instructional needs. 
that's important. If these kids are going to grow up and be able to use the technology mm -hmm. for the future. Well, I think it's really uh, important and interesting to think about the fact that the state of Ohio set itself out to provide fair and equitable public education for every student regardless of wealth or of ethnicity and did that all the way back in when it was still part of the Northwest Territories in the late 1700s when we were writing our Constitution in 1801. It guaranteed every student would have a fair and equitable education. But after, so to pair it with the needs now just shows this ongoing need to continue to educate Ohio's children. And I'd like to um, kind of fill people in a little bit, at least introduce the Fair School Funding Plan, and we're gonna talk about it more next week. But after four hours, as you know, or four books and many hours of discussion, um, we were ready, or getting kind of tired of just talking, and I give Heather Gilden credit because she was the first one that really said out loud, we've got to start doing something and not just talking. And once we started talking about having a project, people's demeanors changed. Do you remember it was like they started feeling empowered mm -hmm. instead of, oh, like we're going to beat this dead horse again. Sure. It was just a better attitude in our group meetings. And Julian suggested that we work to provide support for the Fair School Funding Plan. It actually fits in very well with the education projects we already do at Reynolds and at Rogers High School. And for those not familiar with the Fair School Funding Plan, I'd like to give just a quick history. Um, in 1991, there were several uh, school districts and personnel who um, actually filed a lawsuit in the name of one student. His last name was DeRolf and uh, filed a lawsuit that became Rolf versus Ohio. And six years later in 1997, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that uh, public school funding in the state of Ohio is unconstitutional because it does not provide an equitable basic education for every student. So here we are 24 years later we're still funding public education the same way that it was declared unconstitutional 24 years ago but we have a chance this year to fix that problem um, and again that whole plan is called the fair school funding plan we're going to tell people more about it next week but here's the time frame that we're on it's already been passed by the Ohio House, but now it needs passage in the Ohio Senate and signed by the governor by June 30th. It does have bipartisan support, and so that's a real positive in this climate of uh, the, the parties not necessarily always working real well together. So we've sort of told you a little bit about our book study. We've talked about what the Fair School Funding Plan and the history of education. So I think we'll probably say goodbye for today and mm -hmm. tell them next week more stuff, more good stuff. See you next week. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Bob. Much appreciated. And now let's hear the words of the psalmist as we read today's lectionary psalm, Psalm 98 which reminds us that God will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Hear now Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. 
Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. May God add a blessing to our hearing of this word. Before we hear the gospel reading for today, a couple of reminders and uh, then we'll pray together. First, as I mention each week, please feel free to share your own prayer concerns as you deem appropriate in the comment section that goes along with this video so we can pray for and support each other. Second, if you're watching on Facebook, will you please take a moment and click share on this video? If you do that, it helps enormously because in that way, others can find us and discover uh, what we are all about. And if you're watching on YouTube or listening on our podcast platform, please subscribe to our channels so you'll be aware of future broadcasts. Thank you so much. Brothers and sisters, let us pray together now. God of all creation, author of salvation, giver of all grace, we pray for those who feel forgotten, who feel like your face has been hidden from them. We pray for those who feel pain in their souls and sorrow in their hearts. We pray for those who feel like an invisible enemy is winning and who are shaken by the events of this time. We pray that we might find expressions of your steadfast love, that we might experience joy as we seek to save each other from despair. We pray that we might learn to care for each other and to reach out to the world with faith, hope and love. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, today's lectionary gospel reading comes from John, from the 15th chapter, and I'm going to read for you verses 9 through 17. The text reads, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, over the last few weeks, we've spoken about the salvation narrative of the people of God, the idea of a dying death, resurrection, a new life. And we've looked at what this new life might look like, this abundant life, eternal life, and how Jesus is connected to that vision of abundant life. And in today's passage from John, we really come to see what it is uh, in the famous words, what's love got to do with it? Where is love in all of this? Now, I know you're already aware because we've talked about it many times that there are uh, lots of different words in Greek for love. It is the word agapeo that appears eight times in the verses that I just read to you. Um, this word is a word that I would often translate as to love like God loves. And what's the commandment that's got to do with love? Verse 12 says, this is my commandment, 
that you love one another as I have loved you. Which certainly makes it sound like the commandment is for us to love each other in the same way that Jesus loves us. Verse 17, however, says, I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Which makes it sound like the commandment or commandments are given to us in order for us to love each other in the same way that Jesus loves. The question is really in these verses, uh, is it the word that or is it so that? Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Whereas verse 17, I'm giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. Both verses use exactly the same Greek word, inna. So is it that or is it so that? Turns out that's a lot more complicated question than it might sound. Uh, Kittle's famous theological dictionary of the New Testament has 10 pages devoted to the tiny word inner. We read that John's use is to describe purpose. In other words, so that or in order that. If we were to go along with that understanding, then verse 12 would become, this is my commandment whatever it is, so that you love one another as I have loved you. And that then will parallel verse 17. I'm giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. The purpose of the commandments, it seems, is that we love one another. But what are they? What are the commandments? Different translations of the Bible into English render these words in all sorts of different ways. The New Revised Standard Version of the Bible says for verse 17, I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. Whereas the New International Version simply says, this is my commandment. Love each other. Now, there's a, a book by uh, an author, uh, Mark Davis, uh, no relation. And he writes, uh, do you see the difference? Love one another is not the command itself. It's the purpose of the things that Jesus commands. Jesus commanded, quote, these things so that they would love one another. The question becomes, what does Jesus mean by these things? Well, we can see in verse 10, uh, according to the New Revised Standard Version, where Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in me. So the purpose of the commandments is that we love each other and that we live within or abide in the love of Christ. And what does that lead to? Well, verse 11 in the same translation says, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So the purpose of the commands is that we love each other and live within the love of Christ as a joyous experience. Now, you'll remember where this dialogue is taking place. It's in the place where Jesus has washed the disciples' feet and has said, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So... If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done. And now follows verse 12. This is my commandment. In order that you love one another, as I have loved you. In other words, love is not the command itself, but the fruits of and final purpose for keeping the commands. That's another quote from uh, Mark Davis's book. And the commands are exemplified by Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, the Lord undertaking a task reserved for slaves. We start 
in a world in which there are lords and there are slaves. And then as we bring them together, we discover that when we have equity, we can refer to the participants as friends. And it's only when people are at the same level and can be thought of as friends that we can talk about love between two individuals. When you have a situation in which there's a great disparity, that becomes essentially impossible. And so this type of love that's brought about initially through equity and friendship, that is the fruit of keeping the commandment. It's a new way of looking at the world, from lords above slaves to friends at the same level, which makes possible the type of love that we talk about. Now, in a critique of uh, the present state of affairs, Art Kleiner in Who Really Matters wrote, whatever the particulars of the group it excludes, the core group sends a message that it's not just all right, but mandatory to treat some people as innately worth more than others. Now that's the type of way of looking at the world that we've been thinking about in our book club, where we've been reading about anti-racism, about living in a world in which it somehow seems mandatory to treat some people as innately worth more than others. Whereas the good news, the message of Jesus, is that there is no such distinction, that people should be treated with equity. And the equity leads to friendship, and the friendship leads to love, and the fruit of the commandment in the end is that love wins. So brothers and sisters, uh, a little conversation about love and equity and how that might apply to our thinking about the world today. Let's pause now and say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we go our separate ways into the week ahead, it's my prayer for each one of you that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we end our gatherings, whether they're in person or online, with the passing of the peace, where we say to each other, may the peace of God be with you, and then respond, and also with you. So brothers and sisters, on this day, may the peace of God be with you, and I listen to hear you say, and also with you. Amen and amen. <laughs>